Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hmm. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Kevin Coots, and I'm here to welcome Jaron Lanier to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Jason, Jaron Lanier is one of the most provocative and creative thinkers, thinkers of our time, drawing on his expertise and experience across computer science, music, and digital media to challenge conventional notions about how technology is transforming society. He is the best-selling author of You Are Not a Gadget, and he is well known for popularizing the term virtual reality. In fact, as the founder of VPL Research Incorporated years ago, he was the first to sell virtual reality goggles and gloves, and today he's with Microsoft Research. Uh, Jaron is here today to discuss his latest book, Who Owns the Future, which has received a great deal of attention, earning reviews, interviews, and commentary in dozens of media outlets in the U.S. and overseas. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Hey, hey, how's it going? So this is sort of weird for me because uh, I kind of live a schizophrenic life where, uh, and, I, and, and that's by contract, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm schizophrenic by contract where I, I have one life as a so-called public intellectual where I write these controversial books and run around and blab and whatnot. And then I'm, I work here doing research. You know where I, you know, I, I complain about staffing allocations and and all this stuff that we all, you know, all that stuff. And um, uh, although I can't tell you what they are, but man, we have some really cool results lately. So I'm very happy with my research here. Um, but anyway, um, I, I'm here in my other persona, nonetheless still in the building 99. So it's a very weird experience for me, like an alternate universe. I feel like I've just stepped through some sort of portal. Um, so, uh, one of the things I do a lot when I uh, give talks is I play music, um, and that, even that's kind of weird because I'm talking about the serious stuff of the future of economics, but I sort of still do it as this sort of hippie artist person. I don't know how this all happened, but somehow it seems to work. So I'll play music for you, unless, is that too weird? Are you interested? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, the, the, um, <laughs> This is an instrument I play a lot for audiences because it's, it's just kind of kick-ass. It's from Laos. It's called a can. So that was music. Um, actually, um, there's a cool thing about this instrument, which is it might be the earliest digital number. So um, this is a, one of a family of Southeast Asian mouth organs. This is a, the, uh, from Laos, but there are all kinds of variants of it. And I believe it's the oldest human design of a set of objects in fixed positions that are similar that can be turned off or on combinatorially. So this is a 16-bit number. And it's about 15,000 years old. So this is it. It's where it all started. So we all got in trouble. Actually, um, so I'll tell you one version of history that gets us from this to where we are now. 
In the ancient world, these were traded on the Silk Road, and the ancient Greeks and Romans knew about them. The Romans made a giant version of this to accompany the gore in the Colosseum. So it was sort of like the feature soundtrack of its day. <laughs> and uh, it was called the Hydralis. And because they were Rome, they, uh, uh, it was steam powered, it was gigantic. And there are actually some wrecked hydrolysis that survived. So we can actually see them today. And they're so big, you can't just use your fingers to open and close the holes you have to use these planks that you op open and close. And those evolved into keyboards. So the, the hydralis evolved into the medieval pipe organ, but it also evolved into keyed string instruments very early on as well. And that turned into, of course, the harpsichord and the piano. But from the very beginning, there were attempts to automate. So even on the hydralis, there were attempts to open and close multiple planks at once and build a higher level mechanism, macros. And so uh, this, this idea of building a bit of higher level control into player instruments continued through the centuries. And there was a non-deterministic player piano that could so-called improvise a little bit that actually inspired a fellow named Jacquard to make the Jacquard programmable loom, which in turn, in turn inspired the Babbage programmable calculator, which in turn inspired Turing and von Neumann to formalize this field that tortures us all to this day. So this is it. This is the start. First mover advantage, right here. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, of concern in this talk is the question of how digital network architecture relates to econo economic and political outcomes in a society. And as a prologue, I will describe my personal experience of decades of waiting with great anticipation for the benefits that the availability of digital networking would bring to people. Uh, I had been, uh, in, like I'm sure many of you here in this room, I've been involved in this game for a really long time. And starting in the 70s when I was a teenager, I'd been in infused with this bug that someday by being able to share information, collaborate on networks, there would be this wave of improvement and well-being for people. It would be analogous to the wave of improvement and well-being that resulted from electricity in the walls or plumbing in homes, hot and cold running water, or vaccines, or decent fertilizers, or you know, um, the interstate highways, these basic capabilities that made life better for large numbers of people at once. So uh, we've, we're now years into a period in which networking has become available. And I think we see mixed results. I, I think we do see benefits. But what we don't see are economic benefits. Now, here's, and, or let's say we see a kind of economic benefit that I think isn't sustainable. Uh, so I was personally shocked by two sequences of events, both of which defied my expectations. One of them was just in the musical field. So um, I, 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 I play music professionally, I do soundtracks and whatnot, and in the 90s, I had a career as a recording musician, and I was signed to a major label, and I did pretty well at it. Uh, and, but it was during that time that I was deeply upset and disenchanted with the befuddlement and corruptions of the music business as it was, and I was absolutely certain that if we went to a different model of sort of open source, open culture, and so forth, where musicians shared their music, that the benefits they would get would open up possibilities, and that a whole new generation of musicians would cleverly invent new ways to have careers, and there would be this wave of uh, well-being. Um, oh, I didn't realize I was being interpreted. Uh, please tell me if I'm talking too fast, OK? Or somebody, I don't know, indicate, because I know I can sometimes go fast. All right. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, so 
I was just sure that would happen. And I actually made up a lot of the rhetoric that's become just an orthodoxy today. I mean, what I found is that if you question the open culture orthodoxy and the idea that information should be free and all, you're just pounded with these arguments. And the weird thing for me is I made up some of that stuff. I was there. And I, like, I, I, if you go back to some of my writing from the 90s, I was really articulating a lot of the stuff that I get from kids these days. Kids these days. <laughs> and so it's one thing to be complaining about kids these days, but it's another thing when they're parroting back the stuff that you said. And it, like, it, it's a very weird echo chambery kind of surreal experience. But anyway, um, what I saw was around the turn of the century, musicians just started to do badly, plain and simple, you know. And but the, there was a particular pattern that bothered me especially. I mean, I understand that with technological change and with economical evolution, sometimes there are going to be groups that are disadvantaged. And I'm not expecting that everybody has some entitlement to always do well under every circumstance. And I understand that. I'm a big boy. I get it. However. What we were seeing was a disturbing pattern which was reminiscent of what, we, what were called Horatio Alger stories in the United States, which date back to the 19th century. A Horatio Alger story is when there's a widespread illusion that people are doing well when they're not, and a lot of people live on false hopes where the statistics are so against them that no matter how well they perform, no, no matter how much merit they present, they actually don't have a shot. But there are a token number of people who can do okay, and it creates this false impression. And if you have uh, an economy that's built too much on false hope, it'll fail. Uh, and so that's the pattern I was seeing. I was seeing tiny token numbers of people who had found a way to make do with the new system we had created, the post-Napster system, and yet there was an illusion of a massive number of people who were succeeding, but it was totally false. And I put a tremendous amount of effort into trying to uncover every single example of somebody who was making it in the new system in music. And I continue that. And there really is almost nobody. I mean, statistically, it's a total failure, but there are token examples. There are the Amanda Palmers or whatever. These people exist, but they're just incredibly tiny numbers of them. There's this tall, thin tower, and then there's this emaciated long tail. All right, so that's one thing that really bothered me. And the result of that was a specific human cost where I saw people who'd had successful careers in the sort of middle of the music business, not the Madonnas or some, you know, superstars, but people who were like well-known jazz musicians suddenly needing benefits to pay for their operation or some problem. And it was getting to the point where we were having benefits once a week at jazz clubs to try to deal with the most difficult cases. And I realized we're killing our musical culture, like something has gone desperately wrong. That really got to me. But then, in around two, two, 2007 and eight, the next thing that got to me was the nature of the recession that hit. Now look, there are a lot of explanations for the recession. Yeah, we, we had an unfunded couple of wars. That'll do it. Yeah, there's the rise of China and India. There's more competition for resource base. Yeah, there's more old, older people than ever and more ways to spend money to keep them healthy, blah, blah, blah. But the whole developed world at once went into these bizarre debt crises in a similar, in particularly stupid way around uh, bundled phony securities. And that was really strange. And um, that one really got to me because earlier in the 90s, I'd had a role as a consultant to people who were trying to figure out how to apply what we now call cloud computing and big data to finance. The terminology was different in an earlier phase. but. Uh, and that was, and, and that stuff had worked out terribly. There were a few experiments that just flopped awfully. Uh, Long-term capital was one. Anybody remember that one? So that was this, that was this experiment in trying to use big computation to sort of make a perfect financial scheme. It was fronted by a bunch of people who'd won Nobel prizes in economics, and it seemed very legit until there was this humongous collapse and a huge public bailout. That one was bad, but it was kind of entered into with some innocence, because I think the people sincerely didn't realize they were screwing up. And I knew some of them. I saw it firsthand. I'm pretty sure that that's true. So um, there might have been a technical failure there, but I don't think there was a malintent. Enron was doing the same thing, more or less, but with malintent. And then there was this huge collapse, huge public bailout. And I also knew the folks at Enron. Um, and it was funny, because uh, <laughs> I had a startup in those days, and Enron wanted to buy it. And I was telling oh, no, Enron's this horrible, ugly, evil thing. No, 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 we have to sell to somebody better. So we sold it to Google. And <laughs> now, you know, now I'm, I'll get to that. Um, 
<laughs> Love you, Google people. But anyway, um, then with 07 and 08, we saw the same pattern again, exactly the same thing. And I'll explain to you how I think these are all similar. Of course, there are differences, but I think there's strong similarities. And what I realized is that this is not something where people are able to learn lessons. There's a kind of a temptation in the way you can use computing to create fake financial schemes that just seems to be unassailable. And uh, what I realized at a certain point is that the failure of the music business and the ascent of fake finance were actually two sides of the same coin. So that's a story I want to explain to you. So first of all, let me give you a few models with which to think about how big financial schemes have become fake. <laughs> um, the metaphor I'm going to use is Maxwell's demon. It, who knows about Maxwell's demon here? See, it's great to be in a lab environment. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a teaching tool that's used in introductory thermodynamics. So I'm going to talk about physics. Don't run screaming. I know it's a computer science lab, but it's all based on physics ultimately. It's a good thing to talk about. So Maxwell's demon is, a, is a, a, a little imaginary guy. He's a 19th century guy, so he's eloquent and he speaks in long, long sentences. But what he does is he operates this little door. It's a little tiny door. And it's, it separates two chambers, and the chambers are filled with a fluid. Could be air or water, perhaps. And what, what he does is he's looking at the molecules that come close to the door on either side. And if there's a door, if there's a molecule on the right that seems all jumpy and perturbed, and that's a hot molecule, and he opens the door to give it a chance to get through. And if there's a nice languorous, cold molecule on the other side, he opens the door to give it a chance to go through. And gradually, he's selectively opening this door, just flipping one little bit to separate these two chambers into hot and cold. Now that's an awfully valuable thing to be able to do because then you can open a bigger door and let them mix again and run a turbine, generate some electricity, then repeat the whole process, and you have perpetual motion. <laughs> Endless free energy, right? Okay, so what's wrong with this? Why don't we get free energy from this guy? Why can't we just build this? The reason why is the act of discrimination, the act of computation, the act of even the smallest action is still real work. There's no such thing as non-work. There's no such thing as purely abstract information. And so what happens is the operating, the measurement takes energy, operating the door takes energy, computing whether to open the door takes energy. All of these things also radiate waste heat. They're entropic. And cumulatively, it always costs more than you gain. That's the cost of computation. That's why your computer gets hot, too. All right? <laughs> and so the interesting thing about this is that every possible perpetual motion machine somehow can be equated to the same, the, the same uh, no free lunch system of Maxwell's demon. OK, now what happens when you have a big computer with a lot of connectivity and you can get a lot of data into it on a network is even if you don't intend to, you're tempted to try to turn into Maxwell's demon yourself, but in an economic sense. And I saw this happen firsthand as a consultant, especially in the 90s. I had a weird consulting uh, career in those days because there weren't that many people who understood big networks. And uh, so I got, I worked with the early high frequency trading type of type schemes. I worked um, with Walmart, which was a really important early big computing operation. Uh, all kinds of other examples. So I saw what happens. For instance, one of my consultants, consultancies at that point was with a, uh, it was actually the largest American healthcare company at the time. <clears throat> and I saw directly how it was transformed. Prior to the existence of digital networks with a sort of an endless amount of freely gathered data uh, and this huge amount of computation, Insurance was limited, was computationally limited. The way, the way the schemes worked was entirely computational. In fact, the term computer used to refer to humans and almost exclusively women who were employed in these giant long buildings in upstate New York who'd sit there calculating actuarial tables. Do you know that that's what computer used to mean before, before Turing? And, uh, and so they would have human computers calculating these things, and the statisticians who were called actuaries had a, a limited amount of data, and they could come up with very broad brush approaches to setting rates for insurance policies. 
And that's how the business worked. But as soon as there started to be lots of data and really big computers, and because of Moore's Law, when that stuff got really cheap, a whole new picture emerged. It started to become thinkable to model individual people and place odds on them. And you could do that not only based on the scientific theoretical knowledge that had been published by medical researchers, but you could create your own correlations because you could gather your own data. And you didn't even have to understand them. You, it might just be that people who have purple wallpaper are more likely to have a stroke or some bizarre thing like that. Maybe that isn't bizarre, I don't know. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you, you wouldn't have to understand the correlations, you would just compute them and then what you do is you pretend to be Maxwell's demon. You say, I'm going to open the little door and all the people who are likely to need my insurance are going to be excluded and all the people who are likely to not need to use my insurance policy will be included. So you attempt to make the perfect perpetual motion insurance plan where you take as little risk as possible. So you're, you're performing, you're, you've turned yourself into Maxwell's demon. Now there's a little story I tell which is true and uh, it goes like this. <laughs> There, one of my consulting things, I was with uh, the, a bunch of people from this health insurance company and the CEO of it was sort of taken with this observation that this new world of, that he could become Maxwell's demon, although of course that wasn't the way he was talking about it. And he said, you know, what I can do now is I can, I can get rid of that guy who's going to have a heart attack years in advance. I don't have to insure him anymore. And right at that moment, and I remember thinking with her, oh my God, that's not what computing's supposed to be for. Something's gone terribly wrong here. That's not what we've all worked so hard for. And at that very moment, there was this huge swooshing sound. And then there was like this earthquake and this explosion. And it turns out there was a meteor strike and right by us. And I won't tell you exactly where it was, but it was on a San Juan Island, so it wasn't far. So you can figure it out if you really want to be diligent. But um, uh, so anyway, so what this leads me to is if any of you are astronomy researchers and you're interested in meteors, what you can do is you can use health industry executives as bait. <laughs> And 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 because otherwise, I mean, who else gets to? Yeah, I was amazed to be near a meteor strike. I'm, I just from then on, I didn't get too close to the guy, you know. So I was like, yeah, I hear you. Uh, so, um, so uh, this this sort of Maxwell's demon fallacy um, really breaks for the very simple reason that. The, the overall economy, the overall world, isn't big enough to absorb all the risk that you're avoiding by trying to have a perfect scheme. You have to offload it into the world, and there isn't some infinitely big economy that can keep on absorbing your risk and can keep on providing you with more and more benefits. So the scheme has to break. And that's when I realized that there was a unifying paradigm in all these different failures, that what was going on with healthcare in America was driven by a certain model of computation that wasn't sustainable, but that in a deep level, on this Maxwell's demon level, it was profoundly similar to what I was seeing in finance over and over again. It was similar to long-term capital, it was similar to Enron, it was similar to the recent recession and all the, the bundled derivatives, and it's similar to what's going to happen with student debt and high frequency trading and carbon credits and anything else where somebody's trying to compute a perfect position. Trying to compute perfection doesn't work in reality. I mean, it doesn't even work in, like, <laughs> there's a funny thing where Sometimes I talk to people, they're saying, no, with a computer, you can make this perfect, pristine thing, because then computers are perfect. And then I'm thinking, wait, have you developed software? Do you know anything? Anyway, there's a, there's a whole question about whether it's even realism from a computer science perspective, but at least from a physics perspective, it's profoundly not realistic, and also from an economics perspective. So uh, the thing about these schemes is that they appear again and again and again with different surface colorations, different terminology, different semantics. But this idea of trying to calculate the perfect position comes up again and again. So I, what I've realized is that schemes like Facebook and Google have strong similarities, as do recent large elections that are highly computational, as do the new face of national security organizations all around the globe, as do new criminal organizations. Basically what's been happening is uh, wherever you find the greatest centers of power and clout that have been strengthened and improved since networking, you crack them open, you'll find a big computer in the middle running a fake Maxwell's demon scheme. So I call these siren servers. Um, and it comes from the ancient Greek, from Homer, the siren. 
is this uh, is this uh, dangerous creature who doesn't directly attack you or try to eat you, but just confuses you so you fall and drown of your own doing. And, and that's how I look at these things. Siren servers are only a problem if we allow ourselves to be idiotic. They're not like some alien force or some intelligence that's screwing us up, but it's a kind of a temptation. It's almost like a drug. Because as soon as you can do, as soon as you have this illusion that you can compute your way to a perfect financial scheme, at first it works. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like an addiction feels great at first, then you pay in the long term, right? So it has this drug like quality to it. In order for the scheme to work, the information that feeds the algorithms has to be free, otherwise, it would cost money to try to be a, ser a siren server. So this whole information wants to be free stuff, which I'd been so actively promoting in the 80s and 90s, um, turns out to actually feed this beast. It turns out to actually be the cocaine that the uh, Maxwell's demon wannabe runs on. And that's where the idea fails. So another way to put this is if you have a bunch of people in some sort of a... Um, an attempt to create a utopia, let's say, and they're all sharing information and they're all on a network. The ones of them that have the most effective computers, the biggest computers, the most highly connected computers, uh, have, that have been able to hire the most clever recent PhDs from Caltech and Stanford or whatever, you know, and UW, of course. And anyway, <laughs> whoever's got the most effective computer can make use of that same openly shared information to such greater benefit than other people that differential becomes so big that it's actually not sustainable. So what we've seen since the advent of widely available cheap networking is not uh, the sort of a strengthening of a broad range of people in the way that we saw with the, the availability of electricity and drinking you know, uh, water, uh, hot and cold potable water and uh, all these things. Instead, it's created um, benefits almost exclusively in the most concentrated elite people, which includes many people in this room. I certainly feel part of it. You know, we, what the Occupy movement calls the 1%, if you want to use the language of the left. But, you know, you have this idea of a recovery after this recession that is almost exclusively benefiting a very tiny part of society, and you have a loss of social mobility and a lessening of the middle class across the whole developed world at once which is just astounding. All right, so to talk about this, I want to give it a historical framework, and I'm going to go back to the 19th century. And this has to do with how we think about people in a world of technological change. So the 19th century was strongly characterized by nervous futurism. In a way, they worried more about the future than we do today. We've kind of, we don't really talk about the future as much now as people did in either the 20th or the 19th century. But the 19th century was all about machine anxiety. Uh, I'll give you some of the highlights of machine anxiety in the 19th century. We can start with the Luddite riots early in the, in the 19th century. These were uh, textile workers who were concerned that improved looms would put them out of work. They rioted and they were executed in public uh, in order for order to be restored. It was a very ugly, difficult scene. So um, we use the term Luddite today to mean somebody who doesn't have the latest phone or something. But it started out really as the birth of the modern labor movement. Um, other signposts in the 19th century uh, are uh, early Marx, starting in uh, 1840s. Uh, I, I always like to tell this story. I was, I was driving in Silicon Valley one time, and I heard somebody on the radio talking about how this new scheme they were promoting was going to allow productivity to cross international borders with extreme efficiency. And I was thinking, oh, it's another one of these stupid startup companies. I can't listen to more of this crap. I hear all this. I hear this all day long. And just as I was turning it off, it said, uh, I realized it was the lefty station, the uh, KPFA, and that it was an anniversary reading of Das Kapital. <laughs> and it just turns out there's passages in Marx that read incredibly current, you know. And um, I, I loathe Marx as a proposer of solutions. I, you know, he, Marx had this idea that he was smart enough to know in advance what the perfect society would be and how to get there, and that's a very dangerous kind of anti-scientific thinking because you can only do science empirically, but he thought he could have perfect foreknowledge. So I'm not advocating Marx at all. I think he's been a disaster. But as, a, as an observer of his times, he was really extraordinary, and as a tech writer, he was really good. He might be the best tech writer we've had, actually. He might be better than McLuhan. He's just amazing. Anyway, um, 
What are some of the, how many songs do you know from the 19th century? One of them is, if, if you're American anyway, one of them is probably the Ballad of John Henry. And this was about a guy who is in a race to lay down railroad track with a robot that can do it. And he wins, but only to drop dead from exhaustion. This is a really popular song. And then another familiar uh, element that's with us to this day is science fiction. Science fiction, the genre, was started to explore the anxiety that people could become obsolete because of our own creations. So we can go back to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein if we want, but in the, in the late 19th century, we have just sterling examples from H.G. Wells with the time machine, for instance. In the time machine, humanity splits into two species. Uh, the rich ones are the descendants of the people who owned um, social networking <laughs> servers and whatnot. The other ones are the people who use them, and uh, the rich ones farm and eat the, the poor ones, and they're, they're all miserable. Uh, science fiction is always about whether people are going to become obsolete. There's two kinds of science fiction. We're either made obsolete because of our own machines or because of aliens. Um, but the machine, it, the, our own machines are the much more common element of obsolescence. And so some of the recent ones are uh, the Matrix and Terminator movies and Inception and Battlestar Galactica. and It's on and on and on and on. Um, so, uh, and that was, that was born out of the labor movement. That's a remarkable thing. You can read a crossover, like if you look especially at Mark Twain's early writing, there's this amazing thing where theoretical ideas about machines putting people out of work turn into science fiction stories. You can see the labor moving, movement morphing into early science fiction. So that's actually its origin. And that's what guides so much of our imagery about tech to this day. So here's an interesting question. In the 20th century, we did not see people put we did not see ultra-widespread unemployment because of new machines. Instead, we saw better jobs. Why did that happen? Well, I think it happened because the, the labor movement triumphed on the one hand, and on the other hand, industrialists realized that they had to think about their own interests, and that there was actually a completely unacknowledged commonality between the two. So on the industrialist side, <laughs> um, uh, so Henry Ford was a racist bastard. Let's just be clear about that. His own descendants will say it more clearly than anyone else. And yet, uh, he was a successful entrepreneur. And one of the things he said is that it's crucial that he be able to price his cars so that his own factory workers could afford to buy them. Because you can't have a market without customers. You know, it's like so simple. So if wealth is too concentrated, you can't have a market. So if you want to grow your business, you have to grow the market. Ta-da! All right. It's, it, I mean, it's not, this is not rocket science. This is actually a pretty simple idea and basic, basic entrepreneurship. Um, then from the labor movement side, um, they, faced, uh, they, they faced a really tough struggle. Now, there, there's been a lot written about the labor movement, obviously. I'm going to talk about it in a way that it's usually not talked about from a techie perspective. So from a techie perspective, here's an interesting question. Um, uh, an example of, an, of a technology that used to support this, this huge industry that then went away was buggy whips, right? That's, that's a, a cliche you always, talk, you always hear about. Oh, you know, whatever it is is going to go the way of the buggy whip. Um, all right. So uh, the transition from dealing with horses to dealing with motorized vehicles is really a big deal. And I don't know how many of you have dealt with horses, but I... I have dealt with horses, and horses are, hard, are work, you know? They're actually really hard to deal with. And if you love horses, and if you have some really interesting, you know, sympathetic horses, that's one thing. But to have to deal with them all day long, even the ones that aren't so nice, and you're dealing with feeding them, and dealing with their hoofs, and brushing them, and then the poop, the poop, my God, all that. And then you move from that to a motorized vehicle, and it's like, it's easier. It's like way easier. In fact, motorized vehicles are fun to drive. A lot of people in this room have probably bought a nicer car than they really need because driving is actually really cool. We like our cars. They're just great toys. We enjoy them. It's really fun to ride a well-engineered car. So this brings up a really interesting question. If we, ha we had to pay people to deal with the horses, because who would do that if they're not getting paid? It's miserable. But why the hell are we paying somebody to drive a cab or a truck? Because driving's fun. Like, why should those people be paid? <laughs> and so um, if you ever meet a Teamster and you wonder, like, why is the Teamsters union so tough and brash and kind of, it's because they have to fight like crazy for the idea that even if life gets less miserable, less smelly, and less dangerous, you still ought to be paid. So the idea of, so better technology can be associated with better jobs rather than fewer jobs. 
so long as you decide that it's still okay to pay somebody even if they're not risking their life and if they're not miserable and covered in crap all day long. All right? That was this huge, huge, huge transition. And it took decades to fight for it. Now, one of the interesting features of that realization is that to answer it, to say that people really should be paid, requires the creation of some somewhat artificial ratchet system to give people a little bit of a license or something to get paid for the job so that you don't have a race to the bottom and it becomes unpaid again. So for instance, union membership, uh, taxi medallions, academic tenure, um, these are all mechanisms. And tenure actually goes back to the Middle Ages, but it served as part of this movement in the 20th century to create ratchet systems where people could achieve a kind of a status where they were paid for something that wasn't, that wasn't actually miserable and life-threatening. Okay, now we come to the 21st century. The 21st century, uh, we have rejected that old covenant. And the rejection happened, I think, in a lot of different ways in different places at once, always, always in this connection with the, the, fake, uh, uh, the fake perfect scheme I was talking about, always in connection with um, a Maxwell's demon. But I think the first person to really articulate it in public was uh, Sergey, who I really like from Google. But at any rate, um, the way the idea went was, OK, maybe you can get paid to drive a truck. But just to do stuff online, I mean, give me a break. Information, you don't get paid for that. That's too easy. So you know, whatever work you do online, if it's like sharing your music, eh, just put it out there for publicity. And so now we enter into this new scheme where we're saying, if things get, if technology gets advanced enough that it can be delivered as a software service, then we stop paying people. You know, then we start to say the benefits you get are going to be what we call informal benefits instead of formal benefits. And so this is a key idea. Um, if you talk to people interested in development in the developing world, one of the key well, the key quest is to get people out of an informal economy into a formal one. Informal economies can give you bargains. They, they give you barter. They give you reputation. They give you all these things. But the problem with an informal economy is it's real time. What that means is you have to sing for your supper for every single meal. So for instance, if we tell musicians, you can't get royalties on your music anymore, but you can still, you can still play live gigs. And, you can and you, the problem with that is that then you have to play a live gig constantly. What if you get sick? What if you want to raise kids? What if you want to take care of aging parents? You can't be a, a biological entity anymore. You're always right on the edge of failure. And that's exactly what's happened with people who are living that way. A real-time economic career based on informal benefits is a career of insecurity. And all it takes is one little string of bad luck, which will always come along just because of how randomness clumps. You know, It'll always come along, and at that point, you're knocked off. So it works great if you're an immortal, you know, perfect robot, not a human, and especially if you're an immortal perfect robot who can live with rich parents who still want to support you, then it works great. <laughs> Which is of course what everybody wants to be, but we none of us can be. So um so the um uh if there were only going to be a limited number of people who would be disenfranchised by making information free, that would be absorbable. We could figure out a way to compensate for that. So right now, the kinds of people who've tended to be forced into real-time economic careers by the open culture idea are the journalists, musicians, photographers, those kinds of people. Um, we could come up with institutions to compensate. For instance, uh, there are various attempts to create new institutions to support uh, investigative reporting because we don't have nearly enough investigative reporting for our times. I think that that statement shouldn't require justification. Um, but the problem is it doesn't stop there. The problem is that it, it covers everything in the economy except siren servers eventually. So let's look at some of the upcoming waves that are going to become, I, I call it software mediated. Uh, the, the, it's hard to come up with just the right terminology for this stuff. Uh, 3D printers are a great example. Um, if, you want to, if you're a member of MSR and you want to 3D print something, just go talk to the guys in the hardware lab across the atrium and they'll print out something for you. Uh, and it's fun. It's great. I love 3D printing. Um, it's still early. 
Uh, for those of you who haven't used a 3D printer, it's like this box that looks kind of like a microwave oven or something. You download a file from the internet just as if you were downloading music from one of the end, you know, from a BitTorrent site or something. <laughs> you get your file, you, and then these little nozzles follow instructions in the file and deposit materials a little bit at a time until your object is printed out. Today, we mostly print out objects in a limited number of materials and colors, and you don't print out anything, but, you, I mean, you don't print out everything you might want, but like in 10 years and 20 years, I imagine we'll be able to print out new phones and tablets and things like that. All the components of them are sort of printed already to some degree. Um, I, think, I think we can do it. So what that means is a complete transformation of manufacturing. Because now suddenly you can enjoy the efficiency of printing out things on an as-needed basis and on a where-needed basis. You stop transporting goods around. You stop having factories. Instead, you have this distributed system. All you distribute are the antecedent goops. However, recycling becomes vastly more efficient and precise than it ever, ever was before because you have a precise record of how everything that was printed was printed so you can unravel it with great precision because the information isn't lost. So instead of recycling being a gross process, it becomes a fine process. So you'll be able to recycle those antecedent goops. So you suddenly have this amazing green effect, this amazing efficiency. Um, screws China royally, because you have to then tell them, oh, you know, all that huge manufacturing infrastructure in southern China, you know, Foxconn, all that, yeah, you don't need that. Microsoft's making a big investment in that stuff, you know, eh. All right, so. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, but obviously, you know, as much as the manufacturing sector has declined in the U.S., it's still a big part of our economy even, and it's huge in China and other parts of the world, and all of a sudden that goes away. Now, it's, it's actually not going to be all of a sudden. You know, it'll come on with some slowness, but you know about how Moore's Law works. It accelerates, you know. So, the, you know, if... If one year suddenly you can print a new phone, then a few years later you'll be printing new medical devices, and a few years after that you'll be printing everything, including the printers, by the way, so they spread virally at some point. They're not, it's not like there's some store where you go buy your printer. So what happens then? Retail goes away, manufacturing goes away. I know I'm exaggerating, it won't be that clean. It's always messy, there's always exceptions, there's always gotchas, all that stuff. But just in the broad picture, there's obviously a huge problem here because what's happening is then we're Napsterizing the fabrication of physical stuff. We're Napsterizing material culture. And then um, do I need to list many other examples in a lab like this? There have already been effective demonstrations of automated um, pharmacists, legal researchers, uh, bio bench researchers, all kinds of educated middle level jobs can already be automated. I'm pretty soon we'll be automating our CS interns and. Maybe we can automate our managers. And, but anyway, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so, the, so, so the thing is that this wave spreads. It doesn't just stop with the creative type people. As the 21st century progresses, it hits every part of the economy. Those Teamsters who manage to survive the obsolescence of the buggy whip and drive trucks are going to then face the new challenge of the self-driving truck. And that one will surely knock them out. Um, so let's look, though, at how automation really works. Now, when I was a kid, there was a guy who was the sweetest, most generous mentor to me when I was a very young computer scientist named Marvin Minsky, who was one of the founders of the artificial intelligence movement. Now, in 1958, a couple years before I was born, Marvin had given some of his grad students an assignment to, uh, over the summer, write a translation system from one language to another. Now, that might sound crazy to us today, but who, nobody knew at the time. I mean, it was a perfectly reasonable thing to, to hypothesize about. Why not? So hypothetically, in those days, based on how people understood language then, it should have been possible to take dictionaries for the languages and write some sort of parser translation scheme and come out with a translator. Right? <laughs> now, of course, as we all know, it doesn't work that way. The only way to translate between languages effectively is with a big data strategy. So we have these huge corpora of, uh, that we, we get of, of previously translated passages. And, uh, th so this, so, and it works. It's great that it works. Um, and we, we're in a race with our colleagues at Google and elsewhere to make better and better language translators. But we're all doing basically the same thing, which is gathering at huge antecedent examples and then performing statistics to create new examples. Now, 
let's notice something critical about this, which is that there, was a, there were a group of real humans who translated passages in order to generate the examples that we use in order to create the so-called automation. So it's kind of stage magic. What we're doing is we're mashing up the efforts of real humans in a new and useful way, but it doesn't mean that those people don't exist. They do exist. Nor can you say that you only have to gather data from them once and then never again, because language is dynamic. So all of us are constantly scraping the net for new examples of translations to keep our ability to translate current and dynamic, right? Okay, so this is, this is a key point. There's a kind of um, a figure ground flip uh, or sort of a gestalt transformation that can come into um, application here. And uh, I know I see this differently than many of my colleagues, but this is how I see it. Um, anytime you show me something that's automated or something that's called AI, there's a way to flip it and see exactly the same phenomenon in different terms where humans did all the work. It always traces back to humans. There's not some alien species that's sending down data to us, so far as we know, anyway. I mean, some of the stuff you find online, I wonder, but you know, at least the useful data is all tracked back to real humans. Now, that raises an extremely interesting point to me, which is if we were to achieve that figure ground flip, and instead of thinking about AI, instead of thinking about automation, instead if we were thinking of the whole system as being run by real people from whom the data comes, but just having the mediation become more and more useful, if that's the way we think about technology, which is absolutely as valid as the usual ways, then there's a possibility of thinking about an economic solution that gets around the siren server problem that provides a way for people to lift themselves out of the idiocy of trying to become Maxwell's demon. Now, to explain that alternative, I have to go back to the very origin of the idea of networking. So, the first person to write about how people could use digital networks to communicate with one another or to collaborate actually predates the ability to implement a network because <laughs> it happened before packet switching was invented. And that was Ted Nelson's work starting in 1960. So Ted Nelson is still with us. He lives in Sausalito on a houseboat. He's a buddy of mine. Uh, he's in his 70s now. And he's not the easiest figure to understand in some ways. He's kind of a beatnik hippie sort of person. And his early writing was infused with a kind of um, psychedelic glow or countercultural zest to it that might not be to everyone's liking and is not necessarily as clear for many people as it might be. And, and that has to be said. Nonetheless, starting in 1960, Ted was the first person to describe people using digital networks to collaborate. It's a, it was brand new. I, I'm not aware of anything earlier. Um, and he did so with extraordinary insight. I think sometimes the first person on the scene can see more clearly than people who show up when it's already cluttered. So what Ted realized, and, and what he called it was hypertext, which is where the HT and HTML comes from. So there's a direct uh, descent of, of his original terminology to what we use today. Um, so, uh, Ted had Hollywood parents who benefited from the labor movements of creative people. So, we usually think of Hollywood uh, as being, you know, populated by super overpaid actors who just grunt while they fire weapons or something and then become the governor of California <laughs> or whatever it might be. But actually, the unions for actors and, and whatnot benefit mostly a middle class of people. And his parents benefited from that. So, he understood that even if all you're doing is pure information, you're vulnerable to a race to the bottom where you're, where you're demoted into an informal, real-time life, unless there's some kind of a mechanism. But what he realized is that instead of these artificial sort of ratcheting mechanisms like unions, maybe something more organic could come about in a digital network. And what he proposed is a universal micropayment system. And remember, this is before, this was invented, universal micropayments were invented before packet switching. This is a remarkable thing. They're the actual origin point for networking. So um, he proposed a universal micropayments system so that uh, when people 
make use of information that exists because the other person exists, that other person receives some micropayment for it. So the people whose translations prove particularly useful to a translation algorithm would keep on getting little dribs of pennies. Um, uh, the people who, um, uh, if you write code, whenever your particular line of code executes, you might get a little drib and drab of money out of that. And it's a really interesting idea which hasn't been adequately explored. For instance, let's look at code. We tend to think of the eco economics of code as being a war between two camps, one of which is the open source world, the Linux people and everything, and the other one is us at Microsoft who are supposed to be the evil empire. But the thing is there's this third way that has not really been tested that might be better than either of those. If there's a micropayment system that's activated as your code runs, and the more your code runs, the, b the better you do. And the way I put it in the book is uh, Sergey and Larry could have become really, really rich just from a system like that without having to build a private spy empire. You know, that, you know, that, that, and, but the other thing is if you look at the Linux stack and if you look at the number of people who've contributed to it or the number of people who've contributed to something like the Wikipedia, if that stuff was monetized, you'd see a middle, a middle class distribution coming out of it. So the, the, the intriguing possibility here is that a universal micropayment system might actually generate a sustainable middle class even if technology gets really good and what we call automation becomes really advanced without the need for special systems that are inevitably very difficult and sometimes corrupt and awkward like unions and medallions and licenses and all this stuff. Now let me, uh, <laughs> so this is a big idea. Um, I'm not certain it would work. I'm not proposing to be like Marx and to know in advance what the perfect world would be and how it'll happen. Rather what I'm proposing is a line of research to see how it can work. Um, so now, you know, now I'm not sure whether I'm giving a book talk or a research talk in MSR. I actually, I, so I'm doing work to model this uh, at, down at SVC uh, at our campus in, um, this summer. I'm, I'm trying to build agent-based models of economies and trying to do monetized networks within them to see what kind of distribution of, out, of outcomes we get. I'll, I'll give you a few basic ideas about how this kind of research works. Um, if you look at a spoken hub style network where everybody goes through a, a central arbiter and an example of that is YouTube or the Apple Store. Um, then the outcome of, of uh, sort of winners and losers is a very stark power curve. So that's where you get just a few big winners or Kickstarter is another one like that. You get a few big winners and then you have this huge long tail of wannabes and the neck is pretty thin in between them. And that's when you get the Horatio Alger effect where people think they have better chances than they really do and it's not sustainable. Now, on the other hand, if you look at a thickly connected network where people are interacting with, with each other and there's not a, and there's not a central arbiter um, allowing only one person to get through at a time, and um, I mentioned the Linux communities like that and the Wikipedia's like that, or another example is Facebook, where, where anybody can connect with anybody and people can get compound products out that have been contributed to by many people. Then the variety of people who, sourced, who are the source of information that people see takes on a completely different character. Instead of the steep power law, you start to see something that looks like a bell curve. So the average person on Facebook actually is exposed to a wide variety of people, not just a tiny number of stars. And the average piece of code in, in the Linux stack was, you know, involves contributions from a large number of people, not just stars. That's not to say that there aren't stars, it's just to say that there's a distribution that has a big hump in the middle. There's still stars. This is not a world in which there are no elites and everybody's the same. This isn't some socialist utopia. It's just a world where there's a bell curve instead of a power curve, all right? So um, why do we care about bell curves? Okay, so um, I already mentioned before that if what, if what you like is market dynamics, if you think capitalism has any value, you have to realize it won't work if there aren't customers, right? So that's what Henry Ford realized. You have to have a strong middle class. You can't have a market. It's just really that simple. You can't have a market if you have um, some sort of uh, petro monarchy or oligarchy or something. That's fake. All right. But then if what you care about instead is societal dynamics or democracy, if you're sort of coming more from the left and you don't like markets so much, you still need a middle class. Because if income becomes too concentrated, then politics becomes corrupt. Which I think is actually an issue in the US right now. So the point is, you can abstract away whatever ideology you have, it depends on a strong middle class. I don't care if you're libertarian, left or right, you need it. 
And so what we really should be asking is how can we design network structures so that economically we're generating middle class distributions. Now, the term middle class can be problematic. Now, maybe not in this audience, I don't know, but a lot of times I'm talking to the sort of literary crowd, and if you say middle class, what they think is, ew, the bourgeois, it's our parents, it's everything that's not cool and beautiful and hip. Fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> A big middle income block in the middle, a bell curve. It doesn't matter if you want to call it the middle class. Especially in Europe, that's a really hot button, let me tell you, as I learned the hard way. It's like, you want to promote the middle class? Are you talking, you want, is it I'll leave it to Beaver now? Is that the idea? You know, I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, so um, <clears throat> what, what I think the crucial thing we have to understand is how can we design a network that yields a middle class outcome from information sharing um, that's sustainable. Because if we can get to that point, then the 21st century can answer the fears of the 19th century, but in a way that's even better than what the 20th century did. If we keep on doing what we're doing of siren servers and fake, uh, <coughs> fake Maxwell's demons, we're just going to keep on having one collapse after another with one public bailout after another with more and more concentration of wealth and power, less and less social mobility. It's just the pattern will go on forever, you know? And obviously we can't keep on doing that. I have this sense of how long we have, which is 20 or 30 years. I say that because I think that's about how long the intense technologies of automation will take to really get out there and get cheap. You know, so that's my sense of how long we have. So if we do the research now, if we approach it honestly, if we're not ideological but simply trying to be problem solvers, I think we have time to fix it, and I feel confident that we can. Um, I, I want to address one other point that I often hear about, just to preempt a question that I always get. The question goes like this, isn't it true that there's only a tiny number of people who are really doing any valuable thinking or who are really creative and won't most people be useless in the system and won't it just recreate some sort of elite distribution? <clears throat> and I just have to say, maybe, let's be empiricists, but don't, there's a kind of a weird stealth elitism that creeps in that, that assumes a priori that that would be the case. And empirically, in those cases where we have data, I don't think it is the case. I mentioned Facebook as one example where we see um, a broad middle in terms of who's exposed to who rather than a star system that we see in hub and spoke networks. So we've already seen that network topology changes that. And if it were really true that most people were only interested in a few stars, we wouldn't see that. Now, another objection I often get is, oh my god, how can you be talking about Facebook? That's such, such fluff. You can't monetize that. Don't encourage them, you know? <laughs> and, um, here's what I want to say about that. Um, our job is not to judge each other. I'm not like some cultural critic who's good. Personally, I'm not on Facebook. I find it to be fluffy and useless, but you know what? That's just me. Like, it doesn't matter what I think about it. Who cares? The point is, entertainment's always like that. I mean, you show me entertainment of any era in history in any location in the world, and I'll show you some part of it that just seems stupid and pointless, because there's always something like that. People are different. That's good. That gives us that broad distribution. That gives us those bell curve outcomes, right? So uh, if you want to get a sense of how much value is already being denied to people by siren servers, you can start to, in your own life, keep a tally of the differential between what you'd spend if you agreed to join into somebody's computational sp scheme versus if you didn't. So for instance, if you have a shopping cart at Safeway or another store, keep track of what the differential is for a year. Um, your Facebook activity on average is worth about 100 bucks if we're to believe the valuation. So that's maybe 100 bucks, not a lot, but it adds up. Look at the difference between keeping track of your frequent flyer miles and not. If you think you're really getting bargains from these things, of course you're just, that's a magic act. There's no such thing as a bargain. That doesn't exist. It's just a price. So if somebody says, oh, this is the bargain price, it just means that they would otherwise be overcharging. There's no, you have to get out from under stupid marketing tricks. And especially if you work at Microsoft, I mean, we do them too when we sell stuff. I mean, get wise. Never be the snookered. Always be the snooker in a market economy, okay? You know, general principle of survival. So if you start counting up all that stuff, you'll find that for a lot of people, it's already well up into the thousands and even the ten thousands, and automation has barely begun. So as this progresses, the, and, and, and people will be specialized. Like, there might be one person who's a star on Facebook and another person who's valuable in some other way, maybe as a 3D print object designer, 
right? The point, there'll be special, it'll, all be, it'll be all over the place. But on average, I believe we already have empirical indications that there will be enough value there to create a persistent middle class, not out of charity, not out of entitlement, not out of revolution, not out of some kind of proclamation, not out of Luddite riots in the streets, but simply out of honest accounting. You show me AI and I'll show you accounting fraud, if I want to put it really harshly. Um, and <laughs> it's true, you know, it's like the, that's the flip I'm talking about. So um, there's a great deal more that can be said about this, of course. Wow, I mean, it goes on and on. That's why there's a whole book about it. Um, but this is basically what I'm up to these days as far as the economics work. Um, the book is designed for popular audience and has all kinds of stories about other things. It's, I hope it's fun to read. Um, but that's the core, that's the core idea. Um, I think the key question to ask about doing well in a market economy is, are you succeeding through growing the market or through shrinking the market? Uh, among Silicon Valley venture capital firms now, it's very popular to say, we like funding schemes that shrink markets. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, Kodak is bankrupt. By the way, Kodak, Guess what Kodak did? Kodak um, grew up in the same community and with the same workers, or the descendants of the workers who'd had the biggest buggy whip manufacturer. So that morphed into Kodak. <clears throat> and now Kodak's bankrupt. And the company that's performing approximately the duties that Kodak used to, which is letting you take family pictures with interesting colors and share them with people, is Instagram. Instagram sold for a billion dollars with 13 people. Kodak supported hundreds of thousands of people with solid middle class jobs with benefits and security. So that difference is the difference that computation has wrought. Um, now, the thing about it is that I, I don't begrudge those 13 people. I love success. I love Silicon Valley success. I enjoy Silicon Valley. I enjoy startups. I've done a bunch of them. So I don't have any problem with it. The point is that when we find success, we should find success by expanding the market, expanding the economy. And you expand the economy by monetizing more value. That's what expansion is in economic terms. When you monetize less value in order to concentrate it for yourself, you're actually shrinking the economy to concentrate your own. I'm absolutely convinced that if we got to a monetized scheme, this is not some leftist project or an anti-corporate project. Instead, I'm convinced the Facebooks, and the, well, now it's part of Facebook, but the Instagrams, the, the Microsofts, the Googles, I believe we'd all actually do better because we'd be part of an expanding economy as tech improves instead of a shrinking one. Because to shrink one under the, the ideology of automation is to pretend that people aren't there, which means that we're pretending that the value isn't there, which means that the economy has to be smaller. So uh, it's the wrong kind. We're, I want us to grow rich. I want us to be successful. But we're doing it in a wrong way. And the reason it's wrong is that it's not sustainable. We're swallowing our own futures just for short-term gain. Uh, all right, that's it. <laughs> Uh, 10 minutes for questions before we do book signing, or 10 to 15 minutes. So, um, folks want to take questions, and Jerry, you can just call them out. You didn't explicitly talk about the dimension of the hat supported business model. I don't see it here in your picture, but some would argue that's the root of new measles. The, I'm sorry, just say it again? You didn't talk about ad supported business models. Oh, ad supported business models, yeah. Well, okay. It's true. I didn't talk about advertising. The question? The, he's, he's saying, I didn't talk about the ad-supported business model. You, talk, you mean like Google and Facebook ads. So that's true. I didn't talk about that. So um, the term advertising has been repurposed recently. Advertising used to be an act of communication. It used to be a romantization of a product. I've acted in the ad. I've been a professional in the advertising business because I did jingles for commercials for many years. And I do a lot of work now actually supporting Microsoft advertising, but that's another story. Um, so I have no problem with the advertising business as it's always been. Sometimes I have a problem. In the book I describe how I, I found myself suddenly annoyed by this annoying radio jingle for a furniture store and realized it was actually my own jingle. That was so. Sometimes, of course, I'm annoyed, but, but the thing is, what happened with Google is a redefinition of the term advertising to mean micromanagement of the options in front of people. 
Uh, so the problem is you can't search through a million links, so you really can only look at the ones that are most immediately accessible. And by manipulating which ones are accessible, you manipulate people. And if you have a behavioral model of those people based on big data, then you can make those, that manipulation be more successful. Now, I know that the way we commonly put it is that that's win-win because then you're getting the links that are most useful for you, blah, blah, blah. But then I ask, why aren't you getting those links anyway? Like, why, why, like <laughs> if, if Google or Bing are, are doing their job, there shouldn't be a lot of room for extra paid links because they should already be getting you the useful ones. I mean, it's, that's sort of a basic idea, right? And so the problem with it is that very grad, there's, well, okay, the problem from a consumer perspective is that you, you start gradually being manipulated by third parties who are paying to do so, and inevitably that means that in the long term you're losing prospects. In order for the scheme to work, your information has to be free. So for instance, you get free music because your choices in music provide a, a profile of you that's then used to sell you, I don't know, antacids or whatever it is. But the, the long-term problem, and the reason it's not sustainable, um, in the book I go through how um, there'll eventually be little artificial patches that can synthesize chemicals. Uh, this, this is a long thing. But anyway, whatever technology is now making something that can be advertised as a link on Google or Bing or Facebook will eventually get automated away by free software, so it'll no longer be there as a customer. So Google's business model is gradually going to evaporate its own customer base. So it's not sustainable. Is that clear? And then another problem with it is it forces, it's the only official business plan for consumer-facing uh, internet services in the world of free information. So these totally different companies like Google and Facebook with different competencies and cultures are forced to compete for the same pool of customers, which is ridiculous and creates this sort of claustrophobic, bizarre uh, competition that doesn't make any sense. This would be saying like light bulb and horse feed people should be competing with each other. It doesn't make any sense. Like Google and Facebook should be different, but they're not because there's only one business plan. So, um, yeah, so I think it's a stupid business model. It's the only legal one, sort of, you know, if you really believe in free information. The only model left is to micro-model people and keep the model secret from them so you can manipulate them for pay. And then furthermore, another problem with it is that the, the, we've all grown used to the idea that there are these recommendation engines that tell us who to date and what music to listen to or whatever or what, where to buy our plane tickets. And that, but the thing is, we all know in our heart of hearts that it's a little scammy. Like, we all know, like any social scientist or psychologist that studies the dating sites comes to the conclusion that the algorithms don't work, but we make them work because it's not actual science, it's social engineering. And we allow those two to be confused, and that then creates this atmosphere where big data becomes treated as a form of manipulation instead of science, which in turn sort of makes us distrusted, I think, and I think it's, th that's a whole other topic, but big data is really important. I mean, real big data that's not, that's not part of um, fake business schemes is critical to our survival. It's the only way we know about global climate change, and big models are the only way we know about the human contribution to big climate change. So this stuff is very serious, and uh, the public knows about it in this way that they really know in their heart of hearts is a confidence game, is a scam, and that's really, really unhealthy. So anyway, there are a lot of reasons why I dislike the advertising model. That's not to say I don't work on supporting it while here, because hey, you know, we, we, when, one has to be part of the world and also looking ahead for how to make the world better. So I don't think it's helpful to be like this perfect soul and say, I am just going to boycott reality because I don't think it's good enough. Instead, what you have to do is work well within reality as it is, but then also try to think reasonably about how to gradually improve it. Okay, any other questions? Um, yeah. So uh, I'm uh, particularly interested in the pathway of how we get from where we are to there. Mm -hmm. And a, a common example for me is the ubiquitous evening survey phone calls, to, to which my, my typical response is, well, how much are you going to pay me to take your survey? Right, right, right. It seems like the right model, right? You know, they, it costs them about $50 a person to collect data. Share a little bit of that with me. You'll get better data for less money. It'll all work. It seems like the right model. How do we get there? Right, so the question is how do we get there from here? It's a hard one because we've gone down pretty far on another path, right? So um, in the book I outline a little bit about that. I don't want to be too prescriptive because I don't want to commit Marx's error of, of presuming perfect foreknowledge, but I, um, I think there are a couple things. One is 
every time a new platform of hyper automation comes around, like 3D printing, lately what happens is the open source movement grabs it and says, oh, we're going to have this open source all the models have to be open source because that's the side of everything that's good and holy or whatever. And like just for once, just to be experimental, let's make one of those things be paid just to see what happens. Like what if 3D models weren't open source? What if we just as an experiment said, we're not strict orthodox, we're not absolutists, we're just going to try to see what happens. And if what came out of that is a lot of interesting people doing well and more and better models and all that stuff, that would be so. So one way one way is to do isolated experiments where the isolation is created by technological change. Um, another way is to start theoretically, which I'm which I'm approaching, and then to try to sort of advertise it to politicians and captains of industry or whatever. Um, another way is if all the companies could just get like you know, there's four or five companies that kind of run the consumer internet at this point. It's like hyper consolidated. People always talk about how media is wide open because of the net, but the truth is, in terms of what actually reaches people, it's more consolidated than it's ever been. And we could just sort of get together and sort of try a big <coughs> experiment. I, I realize it's hard. You know, just us and Apple and Google and Facebook, we could just do it. You know, how hard would that be, for God's sakes? Anyway, um, we all get along, right? <laughs> what you're suggesting right now happens in the newspaper business, where they try to uh, monetize them. Right, well, you know, the thing about monetizing is that you can't do it in isolation. The micropayment system genuinely has to be universal, at least in a domain. So, like, if it's, in, if it's 3D printing, it has to be in a domain, because if it's only, like, a local thing, like, if you're just trying to monetize one newspaper, it's very hard, because, of course, um, the, the open free thing will route around it. Um, so, um, it does have to be universal. Um, I mean, I think part of it is ideological. I mean, uh, and I'm partially at fault for this, but we've raised a generation of idealistic young people who are absolutely convinced that free, free information is the only way for things to be okay. And um, they have to understand that systemically and empirically, it's just not working. Like, it sort of works in the immediate sense, but it doesn't work micro macroeconomically, and it doesn't work for your lifetime. Yeah. Uh, I think you've covered this a little bit in interlude eight, but I haven't read the book yet, so I'm guessing. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be you in 20 years when you're talking about what you feel your life will be like as an author, as a public intellectual, as a uh, teacher in 20, 30 years, if this model works? Oh, well, um... I mean, you know what? I, so the question is, what would it be like to be a public intellectual or writer in, in 20 or 30 years? In a sense, I don't worry about that too much because so few people are. That's like a very small part of society. I'm much worried about the broader middle. Like I said, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a weirdo. Like, I, if we designed the future for me, it wouldn't work for other people. You know, like, I, I have to accept that I'm always going to be an outlier. Like, you know, like, I mean, the, a utopia for me would really be a weird one, let me tell you. <laughs> It'd be like, there'd be weird instruments at every corner, and there'd, I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd get infinite resources in my lab. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, you want your own linear accelerator? Sure, yeah, you need that. That, that I don't know. That sounds right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you, like, or how, what, do you have any insights as far as how you would deal with, like, defectors or something in the new <laughs> system where it's by somebody, and you talk a little bit in your book about, like, two-way links, so, like, you know, if I wrote a paper or something and they linked me, then I'd get a little bit of that action and I couldn't charge less than he charged, but, I mean, if you're buying, kind of, unless you DRM ideas, then, like, what's to stop somebody from, like, you know, reinterpreting that and... and well, you know... No better, it's just no worse than the system that we're in now? I always get this. I always get this question about how you'd enforce it, and the thing about society is it has to be mostly voluntary. So, of course, there's like all right. So, um, there's a. I once knew a criminal who was uh, serving time and said to me, "About one in twenty people is going to be a criminal," and that that was his experience. And I've 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 kept watch on that as in life in many, uh, in, in many different uh, sectors of the world. And I think it's a reasonable estimate. So what we can say is 5% of people will not accept the system. And I, I don't want us to become a, a really hard-ass society where there's like 
like the police from Brazil who swooped down on bungee cords to arrest the people because they copied a file or something. And I especially, by the way, uh, right now, I really don't like enforcing, uh, anti -co like enforcing copyright with a really iron fist right now because there's no reciprocity. I mean, like, if some kid copies a music file, but meanwhile, their life is being examined by thousands of remote computers to model them and manipulate them, Honestly, it's hard for me to say to that kid, oh yeah, you're, you better respect those copyrights because they're being abused all the time. I mean, they're taken advantage of. So, but eventually, you know, what has to happen is there has to be a categorical imperative. There has to be a golden rule feeling. Um, look, this is a lab with a lot of techie guys. I bet a lot of us know how to pick locks, you know, or at least, uh, I'm just guessing a lot of you here could go out into this parking lot and steal a car right now and you wouldn't have any problem with it. Uh, and I, you know, they're not that, it, the, the reason you don't steal cars is in part because it's illegal, it's in part because you might have like these ideas that it's the wrong thing to do, but it's also in part just because you don't want to live in a world in which cars are being stolen all the time, you know? You like the idea of normalcy being the car doesn't get stolen. You know, and that feeling, that, that broad sense of a categorical, categorical imperative of acting in the world in the way you wish other people would act towards you is really what holds the whole thing together. The police and enforcement can only do a little tiny bit. And so, you know, this is another example of a Maxwell's demon fallacy. If you think that some big computational scheme is going to keep people in line, of course that's going to break. I mean, give me a break. So, so this scheme has to be a social process in which the broad majority of people feel it's in their own interest, and it has to dem demonstrably be in their own interest, you know, or else it fails. Um, enforcement can play a role. There can be a certain amount of it, perhaps, but it can't be the centerpiece, and it can't be the main question, and it can't rely on. I think there could be DRM, but DRM, DRM should serve as just a reminder of what social contract we've entered into. It shouldn't serve as an iron fist, you know. I know we've got some questions online. Can we take at least one and then have that be a wrap up? Sure. The only question online was um, just about how the market economy works on Second Life. Say again? how the market economy works on Second Life. Oh, Second Life, yeah. So Second Life's an interesting experiment. It's, I think it's a little um, less in the air than it was a few years ago. Um, but um, I was an advisor to it at the start, and uh, it's a, it's a on, you, I'm sure you know what it is, it's an online virtual world where you control an avatar with a very sort of low bandwidth method, and um, it's got a slightly sort of uh, Burning Man kind of a feeling to it overall. And um, I think there's some successes and some failures in it. It, w it is monetized in the sense that people buy and sell, and sell virtual tchotchkes on it. It's not universally monetized and that a lot of things happen on it that aren't monetized. So it's like a, a halfway system. Um, it has pretty poor quality tools and it's a very rough implementation. When the thing was going up, a typical argument I had with them was that you can't possibly plan to ship it with only that. It needs to be better. And they said, oh, come on, we need to ship it. You know, and it was like, it's very much like the arguments we have in Microsoft all the time, I think. And um, it, I think they're probably right because it did get, it had its moment in the sun. Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, uh, the distribution of outcomes is not quite a bell curve, but it's not a, it's not a stark power law either. It's kind of in between. Um, so I'd say it's an intermediate result in terms of the spread of outcomes. Um, and uh, I... <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's, I think, I mean, it's encouraged me that something can work. I don't think it was perfect, and I don't think it, I don't think it gives us, like, proof that we understand everything. But I think it was, it was worth doing. Well, thank you very much. Cool.